I'm someone who is so thorough about needing to know everything and be perfect and understand all of the facets and all of the angles. I think that if you can feed your inner entitlement a little bit and be willing to just try things and just keep moving on, you find your way much faster and things come to you more easily. Welcome to Let's Play by the Gamers, a podcast hosted by actress Kylie Vernoff. Fans know Kylie best as the fiery Susan Grimshaw in Red Dead Redemption 2 and Miranda Cowan in GTA 5. Our series features some of the most informed and exciting people in the gaming industry today. Kylie and our guests discuss careers, gaming, and so much more. If you like what you hear, be sure to check out the gamers.com website to hear exclusive bonus material from each of our guests. Hey everybody, I'm so excited for you to hear this interview. Today's guest is the relentlessly fabulous Jen Cohn. Jen's work as Farah in the massive hit Overwatch has made her a fan favorite in the gaming community. Jen has also appeared in other games like World of Warcraft, Star Wars, The Old Republic, Red Dead Redemption, and Grand Theft Auto. Jen is an actress and producer, a fashion maven, a wife and mother, and as we'll learn today, an incredible businesswoman. Stay tuned after the interview to learn more about her upcoming appearances and what Jen's up to now. Hello, Jen Cohn. Hello there, Kylie Vernoff. How are you doing? I'm good. I am so excited to have you on the show today. Um, I, I've been researching your work for this interview, and I realized... Um, well, two things. First of all, as much as you and I have been friends and colleagues for a really long time, for there's so much time. a really long time. Yes. So I know what I know about you, but there was a lot that I didn't know. And so I can't wait to dig into that. Nice. Yeah. Also, I notice in your interviews that Jen Cohn is sort of like a royal title. Like no one just refers to you as Jen. It always seems to be Jen Cohn. <laughs> so where did you grow up? I grew up in New Jersey. I went to Tenafly High School uh, in Tenafly, New Jersey. But the only bad thing is where I grew up is a place that was designed to have like no public transportation ever at all. Uh, and the, oh, it was ridiculous. It's even though it's it's really close to the city and it's right outside of the city, the public transportation situation there is abominable. Uh, so. As a kid, it was impossible to escape. So I found myself like just chewing at the straps, trying to get the hell out of New Jersey at all times. I had did not have you pegged for a Jersey girl, although I sort of love this about you. Yeah. I love that you're a Jersey girl at the beginning of it all. And were you were you a performer from the beginning? Were you I one was, of those kids? I was a hundred percent one of those kids. I I was always writing plays and forcing my brother to dress up to star in shows with me. And, uh, oh, completely. And then when I was very little, I went, I started in an acting class where I was doing, we were doing an improv, an improvised version of Peter Pan. And I was Wendy. And it was the point where Wendy has to walk the plank. And of course, here I'm growing up like a Jewish kid in a Jewish neighborhood. And I said the Shema and the whole audience got hysterical and doubled over. And so it's my first time having an audience like crack up from something I did. And that was the moment I was like, oh, this is so it. This is the deal. And so my parents, thankfully, uh, said, wow, okay, she's pretty good. She's having a good time with this. And they started sending me to the young people's programs at the good schools here in the city. So at like seven or eight, every weekend, I was at the American Academy of Dramatic Arts. Oh, and I went wow. to Lee Strasberg and Stella Adler. And, yeah, so I did like my childhood through my teens, I did young people's programs in the city. And so I had all my city friends from my my acting school classes. I love that. I think of you as a New Yorker, but I also sort of know you to be bi-coastal. Is that a fair statement or is that a more recent thing? The bi-coastal thing has become more real in the last year. I mean, I've been fortunate enough to have a bunch of gigs that I've had to do in LA. And my husband also has had to work on both coasts. So over the years, I would say we would spend maybe 
anywhere between three and six weeks a year out in LA. But then this past year, I really genuinely split my time between the two. And that was kind of intense. Like I hadn't spent that much concentrated time out there uh, in, in a year. It was a lot. I, mean, I love LA. I have a really good relationship with LA. But I always say it's because I live in New York that we get along so well. I don't, know, I don't know that I'm a real, like, L.A. person, but I have a very good relationship with L.A. I love that, and I, I agree with you. I think there's something about the, the grounding community of artists in New York that gives me the confidence to go to L.A. and really have fun. Well, totally, but for you, I mean, it's your childhood stomping ground, too. Like, for you, there's a homecoming element. There is a homecoming element, although I have to say New York has always and continues to feel more like home to me than L.A. Yeah, I get it. This community that you and I have been a part of, and while it's been changing, the voiceover community that exists in New York, where you and I first really got to know each other, was such a nurturing community. Don't you think? I feel so unbelievably lucky to have been in the right town at the right time and have gotten into the club before <laughs> all the rules started changing. Mm -hmm. I have been, I feel so blessed by it. I wanted into the club so badly. So I, I have a very, you know this friend of mine, another voiceover friend, uh, Mike Landry, who was very much by coastal all through the last, I don't know, 15 years. Mm -hmm. And he used to say, there's a bigger voiceover community in Los Angeles. So there's, there, there's way more competition, but in New York, everyone is so good. So in fact, it's the same amount of competition, but everyone's so good. If you've made it into the room in New York, in the voiceover community, then it's all fair game. Like all bets are off. It's anybody's job. You can really be all for one, one for all, and understand that it's completely random who's going to book what job. So you yep. could walk into a room and feel no pressure because everyone's walking in with the same amount of preparation. Everyone knows that everyone else there is a total badass. You can actually know everyone. To be a successful voiceover actor, you have to be smart and you have to be a good listener and you have to be quick on your feet. And those qualities alone make for interesting people who are doing lots of other interesting things. And so there isn't any of that crazy, that like psycho waiting room energy that you find with on camera and mm -hmm. with stage auditions. Like where you'd feel that, that manic, nervous energy and the weird, competitive looking over shoulders. I mean, it, it was so rare to ever have anybody like give you that kind of juju in a room. It was just all love. So nice. It really was. I mean, we, we like raised our kids in that community, especially yes. because you don't, you know, you don't have to think about what you look like. So you could have not slept and have a toddler on your hip. And I see you and I say, Jen, can you please hold Lucy just while I read? And you say, I would love it. Uh, get her to me. That, that's always the thing that I tell everyone, like that nobody understands that being a voiceover actor in New York City was so incredible because you could just bring your kid, like schlep your kid to all your things, hand the kid off, I would come out and find Mickey asleep in another one of my colleagues' laps, or I'd find him on the floor playing with somebody else. I mean, it was just so, so special to have supportive familial community and really cheer when you hear your friends booking their ads. I get so excited when I hear one of the members of our community on a job. It's like, oh, that's my friend. <laughs> yeah. I don't know about you. So the video game thing came to me sort of out of the blue. I didn't have any experience when I when I first got cast in Red Dead Redemption, but as I was researching you, obviously fans know you best probably as Farah from Overwatch. Yes. Um, but you have done other video games. And Jen, I was listening to you yesterday on GTA and I feel like it was life imitating art because am I correct that your character, Abigail Grayson, was doing a podcast in the game? Yes, you are. <laughs> yes, that's one of my, yes, that was one of the things. I've done a bunch of characters on the radio shows. There's a genius guy named Laszlo who creates all the radio programming on all the GTA games. And I've done over the years a bunch of characters on all those radio shows. That was so funny. I Did you get to improv doing that at all or were all your lines scripted? 
there's usually room for some improv when you're playing in the rooms with that. Um, most of it is scripted, but once you've got a, a sense of your character or a sense of where this is supposed to be going, they love if you beef it up. What's fun is that often it's the same players every time you go in for those rock star jobs. And so you mm -hmm. find yourself in the room with people who you love to play with. So it's kind of like going to the playground with old friends. Like you have your set routines and you have your games you play and you know how far you can push someone. And it ends up being like a really wacky, creative, hilarious time. It's really very fun and supportive. I could hear that in your read. I was like, they are having the best time. Oh, yay. <laughs> um, okay, but let's talk about Overwatch. Sure. Um, how long have you been playing Farah? I have been playing Farah for five and a half years now. I just said Farah. I was talking to my 13-year-old friend yesterday, and I asked him if it was Farah or Farah, and he told me it was Farah, so. <laughs> yeah, he is forgiven. Absolutely. No problem. <laughs> um, you know, I always say that she's such an accepting, wonderful sort. She would accept however anyone wanted to pronounce her name. I think that she would be fine if it was Farah, but she would say it's Farah. Farah. Yes. Okay, and with that, I know... You know, with my game, there are a lot of there's a lot of talk about the difference between voice acting and performance capture and motion capture. But I think that with your game, you've done it all in a voiceover booth. Is that right? It has all been in a voiceover booth for me. I have done no motion capture. I have done none of the I've, I've never gotten I've actually never gotten to put the little electronic pads on and run around like that sounds like so much fun. And I've never done one of those jobs. Well, it is really fun, and I'm sure that uh, right now people are listening to this and going, oh, my, God, we're going to be the first person I to give her so. that job. Okay, but, keep your but, ears open, but, gang. Yes, but what blows me away is, you know, I was really watching a lot of your work as Farah, and I, I mean, I can feel your motion. I can feel the movement. Uh, you don't have any scenes in front of you, right? Is it all wild? It's all wild. I have no scenes in front of me. Uh, I have an excellent, I have an, a, a bunch of excellent voice directors, and I have a fantastic head writer who writes all of Overwatch, Michael Chu, and he's in on all the sessions. And so when I ask for context, I can always find out exactly what is going on and that I'm responding to. However, at this point, because we all know the lore and backstory between the characters, as long as I know who I'm talking to and I'm given whatever the line is I'm responding to and what comes next, which I usually am, I sometimes will know more nuance and more spin because of the history and the relationships that are proceeding than the voice director will. Like the voice director mm -hmm. might not know all of that subtext as well as I will. And it's funny, like I'll do a performance where Michael will go like, yes, right, exactly. And it won't be exactly what the voice director asked for, but I'll know that that's what the people who are playing are looking for. Backing up just a little bit, because I'm realizing, do you want to explain to people listening what I mean when I say, is it all wild? Oh, sure. Um, the way it works when I am doing a session for Overwatch is I'll go into the studio, I've been sent nothing in advance, and I'm just given a list of lines. And it's just a list of single lines. And I might be given a, as much direction as, you know, these eight lines are said with urgency. These eight lines are uh, in battle. These, you know, 10 lines are in a struggle or something like that, but you don't have a full script in front of you. You don't have a full sense of what exactly is going on. And this can go on for hours. I have to say in, in watching your work in Overwatch, I had an idea that you had done it all in a booth, but I was so blown away by just by how facile you are with the relationships. I could feel this complex relationship uh, that Farah has with her mother. Oh, yes. Oh. <laughs> I, I mean, you managed to like bring things to my heart and make me laugh. I was really just thinking she is doing this all in a booth. She knows this character inside and out. Kylie, that makes me so happy. And coming from you, that is an absolute gem of a compliment. Thank you. All of the characters have been filled out so richly. They have so much backstory. They have so much lore. None of them are just a two-dimensional prop for a, a shooter. 
They all have real story and real background. Um, so I've had this amazing time getting to flesh out this character. And she's so refreshing because she's, as much as she's like macho and tough and amazing, it's not coming from a place of, you know, vengeance. And she's not some, you know, sex bomb who's evil for the for the the, the sex appeal of it or something. <laughs> she's an unapologetic badass. She's macho and comfortable in it. She's so comfortable in her physicality and in her goodness and in her striving for what's right. I mean, the, the most complicated thing about her is her relationship with her parents and her mm. parentage. I, it's fascinating. I mean, and when you think about it, aren't we all created by who raised us? That's, <laughs> that, that's the ultimate story. Like when you, when you boil it all down, what is everybody's mishigas? It ends up coming down to what your parents did when you were growing up. So far, is such a classic case of this. And, you know, even though they might have done some things in a kind of, you know, wacky way, she came out so great. So... I, I love that about her. I do too. I mean, it really, it really spoke to me and the complexity of it. But I love that what you, what you're saying about, you know, her being a, an an unapologetic badass and not hypersexualized. I love that about her. I love that about my character. I really feel like there yeah. is a movement. There's a movement in video games towards giving women full agency as characters, as players. Don't you feel that? all ages, all body types, all ethnicities, all gender orientations and sexual orientations. It's so fabulous to see everyone represented. And it's the reason I think that our games are so popular. It's so wonderful to be able to play a game where you see yourself and you can be yourself or you can be a projection of yourself and really be able to rise to what you want to be virtually. It's just exciting. Yeah, you know, I, I did have this great conversation with my 13-year-old friend Deegan last night because he's a huge Overwatch fan. And, you know, he was telling me all the things about Farah's, you know, the wrist rockets and the jet pack and, and these wonderful things and how much damage they cause. But then I sort of interrupted him at the end of the conversation and I said, so Deegan, do you find that um, your boyfriends want to play as a boy? And he said, oh, no. No, no. All the characters are cool. And he played as Farah quite a bit. I have met so many boys who are Farah mains and unapologetically Farah mains. But that's the other thing that's so amazing about the game. Like, it's not, it really is not limiting. People are so open to taking on these characters and exploring who they are as these characters. It's fabulous. It is fabulous. I, I have to admit, I was surprised to hear that gender made no difference to him. And he had some friends with him, and they, I think they were all boys. And he asked them all, and they all felt the same way. It's just what, what powers that each character has. That's all they care about. That makes me so happy. Oh, that makes me, me so happy. And me too. Because So let's segue a little bit. You have gotten to go to Comic Cons all around the world. Has it surprised you how many gamers are women? Initially, I found it shocking. You know, when you go, when you start going to Comic-Cons and when you start to meet fans, you have this preconceived notion of this very one, you know, this one picture, this one stereotype of what gamers are. And I continue to learn new, the, the new and ever-growing demographic of Everyone being a gamer, so many women. There are all these women in fashion who are gamers. There are all of these women who are in health and fitness who are gamers. The idea that health and wellness is blending into gaming in the way that it is right now is fascinating. So when people are talking about esports, it's the entire field of gaming and stadium gaming. Like they're the Overwatch, there's the Overwatch League. Uh, and there were the Overwatch Grand Finals. It's literally a league the way that the NFL is or the NBA is. There are people who are playing the sport professionally on a professional level, being paid professional level uh, salaries. And their full-time job is being a professional athlete like you would be a basketball player, a football player, a baseball player. Um, and that's what the esports field is. And it's absolutely mind-blowing. 
it's it's the aspiration of so many people who are gaming and so many people who are streaming is to become a professional like this. But what they're learning and what's now being investigated and now really lots of attention is being put into it is that in order to be at your most competitive as a gamer, you have to have a certain level of nutrition. You have to have a certain amount of fitness because if you are fit and you are fed properly, it means that your synapses are firing faster. It means that you're able to, uh, to play faster, that you're, everything works in a better way. And so right now there is this huge revolution in gaming and wellness. I, I'm blown away by this. I have been learning about this in the last few months. It's fascinating. I am totally going to go look this up. <laughs> oh, yeah. hang up. Oh, I had yeah. no idea. I'm so glad that you mentioned that. Yeah. Um, you also talked about how women in fashion are gamers. And I know that this is another love of yours as fashion. And I have to say, one of the things about us all coming to voiceover auditions in our sweatpants is that somehow you always looked like the most fashionable, tired mother that I had ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> I still and, look like a tired mother. Always a tired mother. A tired mother. And <laughs> I know she... that you, I love that you, I remember speaking to one of our colleagues in the voiceover world, Stephanie, actually, um, talking to me about how in, inspired she was by your, your ability to turn something that is a passion of yours and monetize it which is something that that this particular platform gamers really talks about how how women can take what it is whether it's gaming whatever it is find what they're good at and find a way to make it a business and i feel like that is something that you do really well oh wow thank you so much well i am a believer in throwing lots of shit at the wall and seeing what sticks. That is absolutely my mantra. Um, I feel like the best one at this in our voiceover fields, like the, the grand poobah of doing this is Ashley Albert, mm. uh, another voiceover friend of ours who has made everything she touches turns to gold and she's unbelievable at it. So she sort of is the sensei in that field. But uh, I... I love figuring out ways to incorporate the different things that I do and build a career that's multifaceted and is just made up of things that only I could have come to. It's the reason why you should pursue everything that turns you on because you really have no idea how the things are going to come together. I mean, for me, I came to fashion because I had always, it was, it was a through line of my life is that I, I was an actress and I was fashion obsessed. And I always was doing something and I had a finger in one or both pots. And so I was helping a friend buy for her store for many years uh, when I, my voiceover career took off. And it was actually when I went in for, to Innovative for my, my interview with them to decide whether or not I wanted to go with them. We have the same agency, Kylie and I. We do. And we got, I, we love our we agents. We love our agents. We love them. <laughs> we um, do. But we had gone, I went in and met with them and I said to them, look, it has to be okay with you that I go to Paris Fashion Week twice a year. Like, so it means I'm going to be missing a week. And they said, oh, you know what? It's just going to add to your allure. It'll add to what's sexy about you as a talent. And I said, oh my God, I love that. Like they understood that that was my thing. And so I, I had to go, yeah, they, and I, no other agency said that, by the way. They were the okay. only ones who loved that. And so I would go to Paris with microphones and with relationships with studios because I knew I'd constantly have to send auditions back. And this is before we all would travel with microphones. So, I mean, I had these fascinating rigs that I would have to schlep with me everywhere. It was before it was so easy to do this. Yeah. But I was in the habit of going to Paris with microphones. And when my friend sold her store and then... Uh, I had a baby, my husband had two movies come out, I had like a year and a half of not going. I finally said, oh my gosh, I really wanna go back to Paris, but I'm not buying with her anymore, what can I do? And I realized, wait, if I'm already going with microphones, why don't I start an interview series? Why don't I start a podcast? Why don't I start a website? Why don't I start a consultancy? And it all developed into Fashion Dilettante, which is a project that evolved over the last 10 years that I have loved and have had the joy of getting to travel internationally and meet with all these amazing designers and people who with showrooms and boutiques. And, and my favorite thing to do is like be a rodent and go through trade shows and like look at things and find 
whatever the common zeitgeist is. And that's a love that like never dies and figure out a way to make it one of my revenue streams. So it's been fantastic. I love Bye. that. And we will make sure that uh, listeners can find Fashion Dilettante. Um, I'm going to tell you a little story. I was at an audition last week with one of our favorite casting directors, but I'm going to leave her name out of it because who knows if she'd want me telling the story. But okay. she was just talking about how sometimes when she is asking for what she needs from clients, if she feels like she's being pushed past her boundaries, she may throw up a big block and then she feels like she needs to apologize for it. And she said, and I kid you not, I need to channel my inner Jen Cohn. No. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Really? Yes. And I think that you have a reputation for someone who knows how to do business without letting your emotions or wanting to be liked get in the way. And at the same time, you are so loved because with you, business is business and and friendship is friendship. Kylie, I can't even begin to tell you how much it means to me that you tell me this story. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Thank yeah. you. Is that something you had to learn as a businesswoman or is that something that you always just sort of had instinctively? I always was concerned about being liked. So I'm always nice and I always keep my side of the street clean. Yeah. But I also have a very well-developed sense of entitlement. So <laughs> <laughs> that's really true. And so the combination, I think that in my 20s, certainly in my 20s, I was so afraid of not being liked that I sometimes would compromise on things or I sometimes would uh, be afraid to ask for what I needed. Or be afraid to ask for what I was supposed to get. And then, and, and you know what? And yet I think of stories like I, I got a job as the drama teacher at a day camp when I was in high school. And I showed up for this interview and I just completely took control of the room at this interview. <laughs> like all the other kids who were high school students who went in to try to get a job as a, as a day camp counselor, like went in like normal high school kids. I went in and I like led them through a meditation and a breathing exercise. And I said all the things I want to do. And they offered me this job where they wound up offering me triple what any of my peers were being given. And then they realized I was another high school student. Like they didn't even realize because I came in with such a sense of, of owning the space. So I, don't, I, I think that when I'm comfortable, when I'm comfortable and I feel safe, and I know I'm right. And as long as my side of the street is clean and I'm kind, I, there's no reason you can't say what you want or say what you need as long as you ask for it politely and respectfully. And you should have expectations of people in your life. Like, you know who you are. You know what you're worth. You know what you need. You know what you deserve. And there is no reason why as long as you, as long as you are polite and kind and respectful, that you shouldn't go for what you need and want. I love that you said you have a healthy sense of entitlement because I think the word entitlement, especially when it comes to women, has such a negative connotation. So I'm going to take that word and reframe it in my vocabulary after this talk. Oh, good. Oh, good. I love <laughs> that. Oh, good. You know, I think there's nothing wrong with a little healthy entitlement. I and mean, when you think about how, how many men, I know so many men who, not to not, I mean, obviously I know plenty of very smart, talented, wonderful men, but I know a lot of not so wonderful or talented or smart men who walk around like they just know everything. And I'm someone who is so thorough about needing to know everything and be perfect and understand all of the facets and all of the angles. And I think that if you can, if you can, feed your inner entitlement a little bit and be willing to just try things. And if it works out, great. If it doesn't work out, no sweat. And just keep moving on. You find, you find your way much faster and things come to you more easily. 
I am, I am going to meditate on that. I mean, I think that is the best advice. And I think our listeners are going to be really inspired hearing you say that. Thank you. Aw. Thank well, you. Um, you are welcome. Thank you. And this has been amazing. And we're coming to the end here. So uh, I would love. So fun. I, I know it's going by so fast. I want to talk I to know. you for like another hour. <laughs> but I would love to end our interview with a question that I ask all of our guests. So since gamers is all about community and lifting each other up, and since, as you and I know, you really can't accomplish anything in a vacuum, in isolation, um, I'd love to give you an opportunity to tell me about a time in your life or in your career when someone recognized something special in you and took a chance on you and gave you an opportunity to shine. Oh my gosh. I feel like that is the key to all success. I feel like I, I studied with an acting teacher many years ago named Kristen Linkletter. She gave me this talking to at one point saying that when the opportunity comes, just be ready because everything will conspire to help you if you're ready. Anything that's ever happened in my career has been because I am ready. And then when I showed up at that moment, all of these people and all of these forces conspired to help me. And that's the most amazing thing when you can have that happen, when you, you know you're in the right place when those moments come together. I mean, even right this minute, as I'm right this minute is, is a great example of it. I had powwows both yesterday and today with people who've been amazing advisors about this next venture I'm, I'm like trying out on. And they both come at this from different angles and they have so much knowledge that I don't have, but they're giving me time and energy and, and taking risks on helping me. In addition yeah. to that, there's another, there's another uh, two streamers who I, I powwowed with in the last month who also have been unbelievable resources for me and have, have like jumped to help me. And, you know, you think that as you get older or established or that somehow that stops, that somehow, you know, you, that you stop looking for help. But I always want to collaborate and I always am happy to say the things I don't know and I need help with and the things I, I need to learn and I'm looking for help. And I think that if we can always come together to try to help each other and, and do whatever we can to support each other, like all of our success is wrapped up in each other's success. And no yeah. one's ever taking away your success. The tide rising brings everyone up. So if you can help to bring someone next to you up, that doesn't mean that you go down. Your, your resources are not limited. Bringing anyone next to you up brings you up too. So I, I am thrilled to be brought up and to bring anyone up with me that I can. I love this answer. And I, I, I really, really think that our listeners are going to be really motivated by it because it's true. It's not, it's not, it's not a, a one specific example. It's show up ready, ready to collaborate and things open up and help each other when you can. And be generous. If you can be generous, if you have a way to help, if you if you have an expertise that someone else needs, or if you have something that you to share, trust that when you are putting good in the world, more good is coming back to you. Trust that when you are helping, that the helpers are are conspiring to help you too. And when people in your community are succeeding, then that means you are in the company of this community that is a success. It's, it's very good for everyone. It's, you're, you're building the team. Yeah. Yes. Yep. Okay, well, thank you so much. I want to try something out here. Let's do it. Okay, ready? Okay. Keep the skies clear for me. That was good. I can't believe. <laughs> that was good. Let's keep the skies clear together. Yes. Yes. Oh. I was hoping for everybody. Well, that was so much fun. If you want to know more about Jen, you should follow her amazingly good twice weekly variety show slash live stream on Twitch at twitch.tv slash hey, it's Jen Cohn. You can also catch Jen this spring at Florida Supercon in Miami, May 8th through 10th, and this summer at Keystone Comic Con in Philadelphia. August 28th through 30th. And trust us, Jen is so fabulous, you don't want to miss the chance to meet her in person. 
For info on more of Jen's upcoming appearances and events, follow her on Instagram and Twitter at at Hey It's Jen Cohn, or go to her website at www.jencone.com. Thank you for listening. Let's Play was brought to you by The Gamers, a community that connects all gamers who identify as women and welcomes people of all genders who support this. Let's Play was co-produced by Kylie Vernoff, Jenny Grossa, and The Gamers team. Laura Deutsch, Rebecca Dixon, Heather Awida, and me, Verna Maloney. Please visit thegamers.com for show notes, to access exclusive bonus material, and to learn more about The Gamers community. And if you liked what you heard, we'd so appreciate it if you subscribed and gave us a five-star review. Thanks again for listening.